Let's welcome these gentlemen to the stage. Come on. Have a wonderful time. Thank you. So thank you all for attending. Um, this is the Token Menes. My name is Alvaro Muñoz. He is Alexander Miros. We are both security researchers with Microfocus Fortify team. And today we are going to uh, present some of the vulnerabilities that we found in .NET Framework. Um, they are related with authentication tokens, so we will introduce them and see how they work in the context of delegated authentication. And then we will present these two vulnerabilities. The first one is an injection vulnerability leading to arbitrary constructor invocation, and we will see what we can do with, with that. It's a parameterless constructor. And the second one is what we call dupe key confusion, uh, which is a way of bypassing XML signature in not just in, a, in SAML assertion, in SAML tokens, but uh, we will apply it in for SAML tokens. So we will review them in the context of the of these Windows frameworks, uh, Microsoft uh, frameworks, Windows Communication Foundation, and Windows Identity Foundation. So um, delegated authentication is nothing else that when you have a user accessing a resource um, that is protected, but the service provider that is hosting this resource is not handling uh, the authentication itself, it will basically redirect you to a third party entity or the identity provider which will uh, take care of the delegation. So the user will go there, present the um, credentials, and then um, the service, pro the identity provider will issue an authentication token. It can be in the form of a SAML token, it can be in the form of, um, I don't know, JWT token, uh, maybe a simple web token, but most of them have some attributes in common, right? Things like the, the issuer who issued the token. It's not the same thing if I give you a coin issued by myself that if you go to a bank. Uh, the audience, if this is a token that is valid for service A, uh, it should not be accepted by servi uh, service B. Expiration date, things like the claims, right? So all the knowledge that the identity provider has about the user um, that will dump into the authentication token and it will be used by the service provider in order to take uh, both authentication and authorization um, decisions. But the most important thing is the signature. If we don't sign the token, uh, anyone can change anything, can basically tamper with the token and just become anyone for the service provider. So uh, we found that for us the most interesting um, step in this process was when the service provider is accepting the authentication token. And the reason for that is that uh, we thought about these two uh, potential attack vectors, right? The first one is that there is a bunch of attributes in this token that um, are going to be parsed and processed before the signature is um, verified. Like for example, what is the uh, signature algorithm uh, that is going to be parsed before the signature is verified. So maybe we can uh, have some injection vulnerabilities there. And the second, um, the second vector is if we can go a step further, maybe we can go and, and get um, the signature, the whole signature uh, verification process bypassed. If we can do that, we can uh, basically just become anyone for the service provider. So we will start with the token parsing one. This case can be good illustration for token parsing vulnerabilities. Uh, JSON Web Token or just GWT token uh, is internet standard for creation uh, JSON based access tokens. We can see example of such token on the screen. Uh, it contains three main parts, uh, payload, header and signature. ILJ field from header defines what algorithm should be used for signature verification. So it will be used before signature verification itself. Uh, in .NET, there are a couple of uh, libraries that uh, can parse G uh, GWT tokens. Uh, we find out the system identity model token GWT library passes ILG field to the crypto config create for name method. And this method doesn't restrict type names, so we can call arbitrary uh, no argument public constructor. By the way, uh, GWT is not only one way to to to, to this method. Uh, it, it can be reached during some token parsing as well. For example, algorithm attribute in signature method uh, element from some token will go without any restriction to that method as well. But you can ask, 
What we can do with this, because we cannot control any data, but actually we can control some data. First of all, it's type name itself, and we will show a bit later how we can use it. Uh, also, please look on the screen. It is example of uh, no argument constructor from .NET framework. In .NET, a uh, current HTTP context is stored in static property, and access to uh, request parameters is done through it. If uh, no argument constructor use this approach, it will be very interesting for, for an attacker. But all these ideas about abusing no argument methods may look not very realistic. So we took two servers from Microsoft, SharePoint and Exchange server, and tried to exploit this uh, problem there. And here is our results. SharePoint returns us different uh, response if a uh, object was created or not. Using this we can get information about ins installed products and even their versions. Also we could write and have an exception that leads to a uh, denial of service. Exchange server gave us even more interesting results. Uh, as we already mentioned we can control type name. And it, it can be not just simple type name, but assembly qualified name with a name of assembly from which we would like to uh, load this uh, type. Uh, .NET allows uh, developers to control assembly loading by implementing own uh, custom assembly resolvers that may be vulnerable to different attacks. Uh, also, uh, often this uh, custom assembly resolvers are installed by static constructors. And usually it's not a big problem to invoke them by instantiation of some specific type. But actually this problem allows us to do this, uh, so it's not a problem. Uh, here we can see an example of such uh, gadget from uh, uh, Exchange Server. On first uh, code snippet, we can see that how it insta is installed by static constructor. On the second sni snippet is uh, assembly resolver itself. Assembly name doesn't have any validation and used as part of path for DLL loading. We can use dot dot trick and can change uh, current folder to any what we want. Uh, let's put all this together. As a notificated user, we can invoke uh, no, no argument public constructor from any DLL file on the exchange server from an uh, arbitrary local folder. Of course, uh, attackers still need to find a way how upload this malicious DLL file to the server. And for unauthenticated users, we think it can be a very tough task. But if uh, attacker has any account in target exchange server, it may be significantly easier. So for our demo we have an assumption that attacker is already put the, this DLL file to the Windows temp folder. This folder used for temporary files, for example during uh, unzipping uh, archives or other, uh, other such cases. Uh, so let's look how, how it will be in the real exchange server. So first of all it's our uh, malicious library. Here is our gadget with two lines, uh, very helpful. We will take CMD query parameter and we'll use it this, its value for starting new process. Uh, as we told you earlier, we, we already have this DLL file in Windows temp folder. Now we can start crafting our payload. Uh, we will use uh, SAML token. Here is our vulnerable attribute, type name, and assembly name with dot dot trick that points to our library in Windows temp folder. Uh, we will start calculator. And here is the same calculator. Uh, let's check in process explorer that there are no calculator yet and we can send this request without any notification. And we can see calculator. <laughs> uh, 
we would like to stress here a couple things. First of all, it is pre authenticated attacks. Also, despite that this attack where it depends on available gadgets on the target system, this problem is not in product on application like Exchange Server or SharePoint. Is this problem in .NET framework how it works with some attributes from authentication uh, tokens like SAML and GWT. Uh, let's switch to our holy grail and let's look how we can bypass the whole authentication. Security assertion, uh, assertion markup language or just SAML is critical component for many uh, delegated notification and single sign on authentication uh, scenarios. It has XML based format and uses XML signature for integrity protection. By the way, this problem uh, is not, uh, is relevant not only in SAML but in any other places in .NET where uh, XML signature is used like uh, sign it soap or WS security. Here we can see a simplified SAM token. Along with uh, authentication information, it has signature element it sh that should uh, protect it from tampering. And uh, this element contains three main parts signature value uh, with signature itself, uh, sign it info with information how this value should be verif verified, and the most interesting element for our attack it's key info represents key that should be used for this signature verification. Uh, let's review how .NET will verify signature, uh, signature for such tokens. First of all we need to obtain the key. Using key info we will extract, we may extract key from itself or using key reference and fetch key from some specific storage. On the second step we will use this key for signature value verification. But please note that uh, positive results after this uh, step only means that uh, this token was signed by this specific key and was not changed. In addition to this, we need to be sure that it was done by proper signing party. So, we are taking key, inf key info element again and try to identify who was signing this token. And of course, the last step, we will check it is a trusted signing party or not. On the first glance it may look like quite good implementation but let's pay attention on these two steps. We are processing key info element twice and we need different type of results on these steps. Security key and security token. So two different methods will be called. Resolve security key and resolve security token. Uh, on this diagram we can see general idea of our attack. We need to craft key info in such a way that mentioned methods will produce different results. One will be used for signature verification, another for authentication of signing party. In this case we'll be, we will be able to use own key for signature calculation but server will still identify us as signed, um, trusted signing party. Uh, in general uh, this attack depends on implementation of resolve security key and resolve security token. But all cases what we checked we were able to achieve these results. Uh, some cases had additional requirements to the server or environment, uh, target server or environment, uh, other were vulnerable by default. Uh, here are a couple examples of differences between these two methods that can be abused. Uh, first method may support some type of key identifier that is not supported by the second. Or both methods can uh, can process element in a uh, different order or even they can use different subset of elements from key info. Uh, now let's review how this problem looks in real applications and frameworks. So <clears throat> we will uh, review now uh, the main Microsoft frameworks that actually accept SAML tokens or treat SAML tokens in some way. So the, the first one is uh, WCF, Windows Communication Foundation that is used to build web services. Uh, for example, Exchange Server uh, or Exchange web, uh, web Services are built using WCF. 
And then the other one that is uh, probably the, the two principal frameworks is Windows Identity Foundation, which is used by any application. Um, I mean, if you are a developer and you're writing an application that want to integrate with an identity provider, instead of um, reinventing the wheel and uh, write all ho the whole code to process the authentication tokens and then extract claims and process the claims and so on, you will use uh, Windows Identity Foundation to do that for you, right? So the third case is when you use uh, WC WIF with a custom uh, configuration. That is also normal in some uh, development environment. And we will uh, use the SharePoint as an example. So we will start with uh, Windows Communication Foundation that as, as I said is a Microsoft framework to build um, basically web services, right? So what matters to us, what is important to us is that uh, WCF web services accept SAML tokens for authentication of the client. So if you are a client, you can present a SAML token instead of your user and password credentials, for example. So XML signature is also used for other things, other purposes, such as proof tokens, but uh, this is out of the scope of this talk. So uh, this is the uh, main code in the SAML assertion type that uh, handles the, uh, well, the processes the, the SAML token, right? As you can see, we have two methods. One is resolve security key and the other one is resolve security token. Both of them are taking the key identifier parameter which is basically the whole text within the key info section in, in the XML signature. The first one is returning a verification key which will be used for signature verification and the other one is returning a signing token. That is basically representing the um, signing party or, or the identity provider. So the first one uh, will first iterate through all the elements in the key info section. And for each of these elements, I will call the try resolve security key that will basically try a number of uh, token resolvers. Like try resolve security key from the token resolver, then the, the parent class, and then if everything fails, it will try a try create key from intrinsic key clause. So it's first iterating through all the key elements in the key info section, and then for each uh, key element, is iterating through all the resolvers. That's what we call a depth first. So when resolving the security or, or the signing token, uh, the approach is slightly different. So it will iterate first through all the resolvers and then for each resolver it, it, it will try all the different key elements or the keys identifiers. So the difference is very small. Basically the order in which all the possible combinations between keys and, and, resolu and resolvers are visited is different but since we depend on one of them to be successful and return from these methods, uh, the order is critical. So what we uh, are going to do to attack or to bypass um, some old token uh, uh, signature verification is that we are going to take an existing token or we can even create one token from scratch and then we are going to sign it. But in order to sign it we are going to use our own private RSA key. So we are going to generate uh, an RSA key pair and we are going to use the private one to sign the token. Then uh, we are going to send both the public key for this RSA key pair and also the uh, identity provider certificate or key identifier. So that's what you can see in the key info section. Now uh, remember the re uh, resolve security key will iterate first through all the keys in the key info section. So it will take the attacker RSA key first and then it will try all the different resolvers. So for the two first resolvers it will fail but the third one will succeed and will return the public RSA key. Since we signed the token with our private RSA key, the signature verification will bypass and it will be successful. Now uh, for uh, the resolution of the security token, it will start iterating through all the resolvers. So it will take the first resolver and this resolver will try all the different keys. So for the first one, it will fail because it does not know how to resolve uh, the attacker RSA key. But the second one, is the expected identity provider certificate so that will succeed and then it will return the expected 509 certificate or whatever the identity provider is sending. So with that we will bypass the authentication of the assigning party and then the uh, whole verification process will be successful. So this is how it looks in, in the XML section of the uh, XML signature. The first element in yellow is uh, the key that we injected and the key that we used to sign or resign the token. In this case we are using an RSA key value with a, well the public one uh, but we can also use for example symmetric key or even uh, other asymmetric keys such as elliptic curve and so on. 
And then in green, we have wh whatever the identity provider is using. Normally, it's a 509 certificate. This is a public certificate that we can grab from, from the uh, federated uh, metadata endpoint, for example, or from any existing token. So let's see that in action. What we are going to do is we are going to um, access Exchange Web Services as any arbitrary user. So we are going to impersonate any user. So f um, please bear in mind that the attacker doesn't need to intercept anything. He can craft the token from scratch because all the information he needs is public. Then he will send that token for authentication or in the um, exchange web services and then it can uh, query the web services for retrieving emails, uh, sending emails or doing basically whatever, anything you can do from, from Outlook. But for this, uh, for this um, demo, we are going to use a valid, a real client. Well, we are developing our own client, but a real um, token. And then the attacker will be intercepting his own token so you can see the process of uh, how the token looks like and, and what happens if we modify it. Okay, so this is not what I'm looking for. So this is Verb. We will be using Verb to intercept the client request. And as a client, we are using basically our own client that is sending or requesting the mail tips for the user one. So the attacker is, has this user one account and uh, is trying to access its mail tips. Now, if we send this request, um, we will intercept that with Verb. Then we will send it to Repeater to modify it more more easily. And if we switch to the XML version, you will see that, well, we have first the, the SAML token that identifies the user and then the, the body of the SOP request. So we are going to replace any, every instances of user one with administrator so in order to try to impersonate the administrator. Now, if we send this, um, this request because the content has changed and the signature is no longer matching, uh, the server should reject this request. It's no longer valid because it's not signed and we are not supposed to have the private key for the identity provider. So we get an error and this is expected, right? You, sh you should not be able to tamper any existing token. Now, we can use our uh, dupe key injector uh, bear plugin uh, that is going to resign the token using an RSA key. So as you can see here, uh, the original token has this um, identity provider certificate. Now if we click on resign with RSA key, it will basically generate an RSA key pair, use the private one to resign the token and use the public one in the key info section. So in the key info section now we have the expected identity provider certificate prepended by the key that we use to resign the token. Now if we send that, we will get a 200 successful response. In this case, we are uh, requesting the mail tips for the administrator, but this is just an example. We can ask uh, for any uh, mail items, uh, send, uh, send emails or whatever. So. Now let's re now let's review another uh, .NET framework, Windows Identity Foundation or just uh, WIF is software framework for building identity aware applications and it's very easy to add a delegated identification for your, for your uh, application and support identification token from uh, different uh, secur security token services uh, like uh, Active Directory Federation services, uh, Azure Active Directory or Windows Azure uh, access control services or others. WIF uses SAML security token handler for uh, SAML token parsing and it uh, uses a bit different uh, way uh, to work with key info section that we just saw in, 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 in uh, the previous section. Uh, during token parsing, when he tries to get security key for uh, signature value verification, it takes only the first element from key info. But for security token, it will process all elements uh, from this key info section. 
also by default uh, it uses issure token resolve that seems to be secure because uh, code in both methods are very similar. But if they, this method cannot resolve some key identifier, they, it will be passed to the next resolver. X509 certificate store token resolver. And this one has differences in, in, in these two methods. Resolve security key uh, uh, can work with encrypted symmetric keys. But resolve, resolve security token doesn't support it. Uh, definitely this can be exploited, but there are a couple problems with this scenario. Uh, server needs to decrypt our symmetric key. To do this, it should have a certificate with private key in some specific uh, certificate storage. By default configuration, it's a local machine trusted people. Also, mm, uh, attacker would need to use public key of this certificate for encryption. Um, but note, it's just public key. In many cases, it's not a problem. And if these two requirements are met, we are still able to uh, perform our attack. We can use our symmetric key for uh, signature calculation. After that, we will encrypt it by public key from server certificate and we'll put encrypted uh, key in on the first place. After that, we append expected certificate. So on the server, resolve security key will return our symmetric key and we will pass signature verification. But resolve security token will skip this, uh, this element because it cannot work with it. And we'll take the second one that represents expected sign in party. So we will be authenticated uh, as sign in party. Here we can see example of key info for such attack. Uh, our encrypted key in uh, cipher data. Uh, internal key info in yellow section represents a, a server certificate which public key was used for encryption and the similar as uh, in previous uh, our example. In green section we have a certificate uh, of trusted sign in party. Uh, we were reviewing default configuration of WIF but it uh, allows a lot of customization. So let's look on uh, one of example of customized uh, WIF. So one of the most interesting targets for us was SharePoint and it's actually using um, WIF, um, Windows Identity Foundation, but it's customizing this process, right? Um, so you can customize it in multiple ways, like for example, changing the default uh, certificate store, as Alex mentioned before, or a different way of customizing WIF is using a custom resolver. Um, so maybe you have some special needs and you have to uh, process authentication tokens in a different way. So that's exactly what SharePoint does, and it uses this SP issuer, issuer token resolver. And it's a regular token resolver, but the key resolution uh, supports intrinsic keys such as symmetric or asymmetric keys, and token, uh, token resolution does not support them. So we are back in the scenario of uh, WCF where we don't need, we don't have any limitations about getting access to public, public keys and certificates from the server side, and we can just basically use our own symmetric key to resign the, the token and then include both the symmetric key and the expected identity provider certificate. Because of this difference in the resolution, uh, each method will return a different element and the first one will be used for signature verification, the other one will be used for authentication of the signing party. So in this case, we are using a symmetric key. We can also use the RSA one that we saw before, but in this case, we are using binary secret that is uh, basically the way of specifying a symmetric key in a token. As you can see here, there is no encryption, so there is no need to send the public key for, that was used to, for, uh, for encryption, and it's just sent in the row. Uh, in green section, we have the expected identity provider um, certificate. So we were like, wait, uh, we can bypass SharePoint authentication both on premises and on Office 365, which is pretty cool. But then when we try to actually uh, break into SharePoint, we realized that we were not able because the SharePoint authentication flow is a little bit special. So the, the user will get an authentication token from the identity provider. 
and we'll present this authentication token to SharePoint. SharePoint will validate this token by using the SharePoint issuer resolver that we just saw, which is vulnerable. So, so far so good. We can bypass the signature uh, verification of this process. But then SharePoint doesn't know what to do with a SAML token. So it will exchange this SAML token uh, in the SharePoint uh, security token services, that, which is an internal web service of SharePoint. And then it will try to get a session token in, in exchange. So this uh, SharePoint uh, security token service, it's using a different, it's a web service uh, using WCF but using WIF for processing the authentication token. So it's using the default um, WIF token resolver which uh, depends on the attacker being able to get access to this, uh, this certificate. So this whole, whole process was getting a little bit complicated because also the attacker needs to craft the key info section in such a way that it bypasses the signature verification for both um, token uh, validations, so it was kind of complex. So we found uh, a different way of attacking SharePoint by abusing the step number six, which is where uh, the session token gets into the cache. So um, we are going to, what we are going to do is basically we are going to authenticate as, um, as the attacker, as a, maybe a low privilege account. So this is a privilege escalation, maybe a remote code execution vulnerability. So we get authenticated as the attacker account uh, following the default um, authentication flow, there is no attack here, no, no dupe key confusion, nothing. But the attacker session token will get cached, right? Now, uh, what we are going to do is we are going to craft a special token. And it's special because it contains some special um, claims and attributes in the SAML token. So, first of all, the issuer will be SharePoint instead of the identity provider. Second, we will be using the victim or the user that we, can, we want to impersonate uh, attributes as for example the UPN, the user principal name claims. But we will still use the attacker identifier for the uh, cache key, right, for the, the, the cache um, reference. So SharePoint will receive our token, will validate using the SharePoint token resolver which is vulnerable, we can bypass that. But since the token is issued by SharePoint, it will not try to exchange with the local uh, security token services. It will just generate a session token from the data in our token. So it's going to create a session token for the victim, right? But it's uh, going to try to uh, cache the token and it's going to use the key for the cache that we send. So that's the, the attacker cache key. So with that we will be able to poison the cache and replace the attacker session token with the victim session token. So now, now the attacker only has to log in, to, not log in but refresh the browser and then we are going to cut to uh, retrieve the victim token from the cache, from the attacker cache. So let's see that in action maybe. It's more clear. So we are going to log in into SharePoint. Uh, in this case we are using ADFS to, for, as the identity provider but could be Azure Active Directory or any identity provider. And we are logging as the attacker. So maybe a low privilege account, uh, maybe we want to impersonate another user or maybe we want to become administrator to get remote code execution. So we are the attacker, so far so good, no attack yet. So now we are going to use, uh, well, we are going to visit this API URL that will get us a list of existing users in SharePoint. So um, the purpose here is to collect information to craft this malicious token, right? So we will search for the attacker internal ID in this XML. And this is um, the attacker internal ID. We will need that to craft the, the malicious token. But this is public information. You can just query the, the right API. Now we will search for the victim internal ID. Very similar. And now we will use um, some script basically to craft our malicious token. So for the malicious token we are going to use all the claims that represents the, the victim. So the victim internal ID, the victim uh, email address. But for the application token cache key that is a special claim, we will be using the, the attacker one. So now if we generate the token, first of all we will have uh, our key info section with the dupe key confusion. So first of all the RSA key that we use to sign the token and then whatever the key, the SharePoint identity provider or ADFS in this case was using. 
And then if we scroll up, we will see the, the claims in the SAML token. So for example, we have uh, the user ID that is pointing to the victim, so it's the internal victim ID. But this special application token cache key will be the attacker one. And this is the one that will be used to reference the cache entry that is going to be um, poisoned or replaced. So we send that. Our, all we have to do now is go back to the browser, refresh the session and basically get authenticated as the victim. So remember if we impersonate the administrator, this is basically remote code execution and SharePoint on premise and, and cloud versions. <laughs> Thank you. So with that and just to wrap up, uh so First of all, we are not saying that SAML or WS Federation are insecure protocol. The, the devil is in the implementation, in the details. In this case, .NET was vulnerable because it's actually processing the same user control data with two different methods uh, that has some small inconsistency. So if you are a code reviewer, you may always want to um, review this kind of uh, scenarios where you have two methods, two different parsers processing the same user controlled, uh, controlled data. Also we focus our research in .NET. Um, we don't expect this very same flow to exist in other languages or, or libraries because it's very specific to .NET because of the way that they uh, extract the key in one, in one step and then the token in a different step but there may be similar vulnerabilities in other languages and libraries. Um, also um, XML signature is not only used for SAML assertion uh, remember this is a vulnerability in XML signature. It's not a vulnerability in SAML. So we found different cases uh, where .NET framework was using XML signature that we reported to Microsoft and are patched now but there may be other cases where XML signature is used maybe in, in customer or in um, people applications that are still vulnerable. And last but not least, patch as soon as possible because the cloud version have been patched but uh, on premises uh, like SharePoint Exchange or any WIF application are still vulnerable. And if, um, so uh, go on to the uh, Microsoft security bulletin because there are some specific instructions on how to upgrade for example on how to patch SharePoint. Right? So it's not a straightforward and if you are uh, patching SharePoint you have to update SharePoint version but also update some library version is not, not easy. So with that our, we are releasing a bird plugin, um, the one that I showed you in the first demo. Uh, it's basically a plugin that allows you to intercept some old tokens, uh, some old requests and then resign them either using an RSA key or using uh, the public key from a certificate if you can get access to that for the WIF um, scenario. So with that if you have any questions or you can take them now or maybe later. Ah, we published a white paper with all the details. Uh, it's uh, hosted in the Black Hat server, so just go and and take it from there. So. No questions. Thank you.